Lord is when the Lord takes the church out of the way and deals with the world. But the day of the Lord is the day that the Lord is in charge. Could the day of the Lord be operating in my life today? Yeah. Yeah. If I'm letting the Lord lead in my life, the day of the Lord is right now. Lord, you be Lord and you be Master. And you'll find, if you're like me, that it's not a full day. And it's really a day is not a 24-hour day for the Lord. It's a whole period of, what did we say, tribulation, seven years, millennium, a, th a thousand years, plus getting things ready for the white throne judgment and the torching, well over a million years, well over a thousand years, I should say. But the day of the Lord with you and me can be right now, minute by minute. And if we're honest, we'll look back at the end of the day and say, you know, from my humble opinion, warped as it is, out of this 24-hour day, I think maybe six hours were the day of the Lord. Six hours were days of the flesh, the day of the flesh, and the other uh, part, I was asleep. <laughs> Who knows what happened then? So, Lord, I'm not content that you were Lord for such a short time. I want the day of the Lord to be a full day, a full 24 hours for me, day in and day out. That's a worthy prayer. I really want for you to be Lord. But the day of God can come to us in the day of the Lord if we will surrender to him. Now, verse 14, the last section, let's be steadfast. We are patient. We are aware of the recreation of heavens and earth. Now, let's be steadfast and let him renew us individually. He wants us to live in his purity, and he wants us to grow in his grace. Everything that lives has to grow, or it's going to die, right? So verse 14, therefore, beloved, again, he's using that word beloved, looking forward to these things, we should be looking forward to the Lord, the new heaven and new earth, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless. And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, Beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. So in verse 14, again we're looking to the Lord's return. And he says, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. It seems almost in Congress that you have to be diligent to be peaceful. We think of peaceful as no strife, no problems, just resting. But <coughs> if you've been alive more than about a minute, you realize that's gonna take work. How do you have peace in your family? It just kinda of happens, right? Choose the right spouse, and have the right kids, and they just happen to all be peaceful, right? You can always tell a bachelor when he's describing a family, can't you? That? No, no, it's going to take work. It's going to take work. And sometimes you're not successful. Sometimes, no matter how hard you try, you cannot reconcile with somebody. And that's why Paul says, as much as lies within you, be at peace with all men. Sometimes you just can't help it. But you do what you can. In any event, be diligent, really work to find yourself by him in peace. When he finds you, may he find you in peace. When he comes to get you in the rapture, may he find you, yes. How about right now? May he find you at this moment in peace. Lord, find me every moment in peace. And the word peace, incidentally, in the Hebrew, we all know the word shalom, the Greek word is irene, and it means a lot more than just the absence of strife. It really means wellness, wholeness, it means prosperity, blessing in every sense of the word. 
That's why when Jesus would say, and even in the Israel today, they'll open a conversation and close it with the word shalom. It's very much akin to the word salvation. <coughs> Complete and full in every area of your life. Peace, not only in relationships, but fee, peace in your finances. When you've got too much month and not enough money, there's no peace. Physical illness doesn't cause peace. And so he says, I want you to be found in peace, and here's how you do it. Without spot and blameless. First of all, you are without spot and blameless when you come to Christ. That's called justification. The moment you come to Christ, he justifies you, declares you righteous, and says as far as your position in the family of God, you are without spot and blameless. You have no sin. My son bore that for you. But now we have the daily practical walk. Day by day. And that's not justification, but they call that sanctification. Being sanctified or set apart by God. Now God wants to take that daily walk of ours and make it more and more without spot and blameless. And that's not always going to happen, is it? You and I are going to sin. We're going to make mistakes. And what do we do if we sin and make mistakes? Come next week and I'll tell you. I will tell you right now. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, I'm sorry for that thought. That action, that reaction, cleanse me by your blood. And then you're cleansed again. And then you sin again, and then you ask his forgiveness. And that's the Christian walk. So daily, your sanctification is not always perfect. But in Christ, your position is secure. You are in him, and you are perfect. And that's how you have peace. And then verse 15, consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. Didn't he say that back in verse 9? The long-suffering was that none should perish, but all come to repentance. Here's the same thing. The long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. So boo-hoo for me, he didn't come today, but happy for others that they're going to get saved today. As a matter of fact, let's get off the sidelines, Jerry. Let's get on the playing field. Make me a part of bringing someone to Christ today, Lord. If I can't get them to say, I do, to Jesus, and let, let them at least see Jesus in me. And I'll be a part of it to that extent, as long as they're saved. And as far as salvation is concerned, that's not something I invented, Peter says. Paul talked about that in all of his letters. Our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written this to you. Beloved brother Paul. And this is written by a man who was severely rebuked by Paul in front of the leaders of the church from Jerusalem, as well as all the saints where they were. I think they were down at Antioch, I'm not certain. Paul had to rebuke Peter for being a hypocrite. Peter was Mr. Love All the Gentiles, eating with the Gentiles. The Lord had shown him that there's nothing unkosher, unclean through Christ. And so he was a great party guy, eating with the Gentiles and what have you. As soon as the Jewish Christians come down from Jerusalem, ooh, he's a good Jewish boy. And he refuses to eat with the Gentiles. And Paul takes him to task in front of everybody. And that's the way to do it. When you sin, you need to be rebuked in front of those that you sinned before. If you sin with one person, rebuked before one. The congregation, you got to apologize to the congregation. President, get on the television and tell the world you did wrong, right? That'll be the day. Anyway, he rebuked him. You're being a hypocrite. You don't mind being a Gentile, but now you want the Gentiles to become Jewish? Shame on you. Well, Peter could have gotten his nose out of joint, could have sucked it up and gotten angry, not talked about Paul, but he was humble. He realized that Paul was right, obviously, and he was still his beloved brother. And so fine, he goes on to talk about Paul and about salvation, talks about his letters. Verse 16, in all his epistles, he speaks in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of the scriptures. You know, when I first read that in the old days, I would think, 
Maybe Paul was being complicated and Paul's language was hard to understand. That's not what he's saying. He's talking about salvation. He's talking about the things that are hard to understand. Are there some things that are hard to understand, such as salvation? Especially as you're trying to reach somebody who is twisting it to his own destruction. Try explaining salvation to unsaved members of your family. Unsaved friends, try that. It doesn't work. I don't care how eloquent you are, how simple you are. You have a nice little tract. That little tract that they used to have uh, with the Campus Crusade, whatever, the two little cliffs you have, and then you've got that little gap between and the cross. It couldn't be any simpler. I used to use that. They have no understanding what you're talking about. It takes the Holy Spirit to open their minds. So when you're going out to tell others about it, pray for the Holy Spirit, not only to be on your lips, but to be in their minds, to open their minds. These are hard to understand, especially for those who are trying to twist it, as they do the rest of all of Scripture. You, therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. The wicked are going to try to lead you astray. Be aware, be warned, and avoid them. And instead, I want you to grow. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Every day should be a growing experience. Lord, I look forward to growing today. We should be growing spiritually every day. And the younger ones are growing physically, and the older ones are growing physically. Maybe in the wrong direction, but we're growing. But we're all growing spiritually in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace is God's undeserved, unmerited favor. And the knowledge of Him is the personal, experiential knowledge. Oh, you can read the Bible all day long. Read the Gospels. You'll know about him in your head and academically, but you've got to know him personally. Lord, I want to know you personally. And you'll know him even in adversity, and especially in adversity. You'll call upon him and he'll be there for you. But you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and our Savior. He needs to be both. Not just the one who saved your soul, but the one who is truly Lord of your day, this day. The Master. To him. Be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Not to myself.